Hello, it's Saturday the 9th of December 2023. What's the time? 8 o'clock in the morning, that is. Right, we have 10C, which is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Where's my piece of paper? 93% humidity. And the barometer, 994 millibars. The flag, actually it's a bit dark out there. The flag is, well, it's all wet and horrible and wrapped round the pole. I've got my new flag to put up. I won't do that today. The forecast is lashing rain all day. It really is pouring down out there at the moment. No wind, 10 degrees, not too bad. It's just the rain. We've got weather warnings in place from the Met Office along the south coast of the UK in particular. It's always here because of the channel, the English Channel. You know, you get the winds whipping up across the channel and affecting us here on the coast. So there's warnings of, was it 60 miles an hour or more? Basically a very wet weekend. Not to worry. Let's move on. John, nice to hear from you. This memory, you were under two years of age, you say. Your sister, who's older than you, bought you a red siren suit and uh, you were in front of the dressing table mirror and you're also wearing jumping jack shoes. You can feel the support they were providing for your feet. You remember reaching the mirror and seeing your reflection, a little blonde-haired boy. And you remember your sister talking to you about how you looked in that suit. That's amazing. And you're under two years old. That's amazing, isn't it? I've got some more emails, which I will be reading out later, about distant memories. I must just tell you this. You know, I've been banging on about these headlines about the weather. This is the latest. Do you remember there were a few, was it last week? Nordic snow wall to smash into Britain just days before Christmas. What on earth are they on about? What sort of, I mean, who wrote this? Nordic snow wall to smash into Britain just days before Christmas. They're mad, these these people. They're balmy, these headline writers. You wouldn't have had that. Can you imagine in the 50s or 60s, people would have said, well, what's the matter with it? Who wrote that rubbish? They keep on about this snow bomb and snow event and snow goodness knows what. All we've had here is rain bit of frost, a little bit of ice, rain, sunshine as it is today, nice day, blue sky. Anyway, I thought I'd read that out to you. <laughs> what was it again? Nordic snow. What is a snow wall? Snowfall, yes, but a, a wall of snow, presumably, to smash into Britain. That's <laughs> truth. I think that's the trouble these days, not only with weather forecasts, but whatever they tell you on the telly, whatever's happening... They dramatise it, don't they? They make it out a mountain out of a molehill. For example, they might say something like, Fred Bloggs, MP for wherever, was finally forced to admit blah, blah, blah. The truth of the matter is that Fred Bloggs, MP for wherever, suggested that, yes, that probably was the case. He wasn't forced to finally admit. They just get all these words wrong. They have to dramatise everything. It's horrible these days trying to watch the news. When you say someone finally was forced to admit something, it sounds like they've been lying. And that wasn't the case in my fictitious Mr Bloggs. He wasn't lying. He just finally agreed with something, whatever, that someone else has said. I don't know. You know what I mean? They make out that people have been lying and stuff, finally forced to admit. It's all rubbish these days. That's why I don't bother with politics. Oh, by the way, that reminds me, Roy. Hello, Roy from Canada. Nice to hear from you. You love the podcast. Uh, One reason you love the podcast, you say, is because there's no politics. Do you know, a lot of people have said that, Roy, over the years. A lot of people have said to me, thanks for not going into politics. I think there's a time and a place for everything. And the time and the place for politics and all that rubbish isn't uh, on the podcast. On the podcast episode. What Did you hear that motorbike? (laughs) Struth. <laughs> I don't know what that was. It sounded pretty throaty, didn't it? Uh, it was a motorbike. It went roaring past. I've got to, <laughs> I've got to add this. Uh, Fred, was it Fred Bloggs, uh, MP for wherever? Being an MP, he probably was lying. Because <laughs> they all seem to lie, don't they? In the old days, I mean, MPs have always lied. Yeah, we know that. Politicians lie. That's part of the... That's what you need for the the criteria for the job, isn't it? Unless you can lie, you won't get the job. 
But they were more subtle in the old days. These days it's blatant, isn't it? Blatant lying. <laughs> anyway, let's move away from politics. What are we going on about? Have I got notes here? Now, here's the thing. Are these notes from last... I've got notes here. Are these from last week? Ian, talking about my son. Yes, I've done these, haven't I? Talking about my son coming over from uh, North Carolina and the changes in the country here. Bob travelling back in time. I've done this. Talk about <laughs> disorganised. What's the point of having notes all over the desk here? Sorry, my cheap pine table. Oh, I mustn't say that. If they're notes from kind of decades ago, well, a few days ago, I suppose. Just going back to Bob, though. That is right, Bob, you were saying about going back in time. Do you remember I was talking about that last week, having been conditioned for 2023 sort of thing, to suddenly find yourself back in 1953 would be horrendous because where's your mobile phone, your computer? I mean, so much has changed, so much, that it would be awful to be plunged back into that time and uh, you'd miss everything, wouldn't you? You just couldn't do it. But uh, as I said before, what I meant, really, what I've always meant is not going back in time, but just being there, <laughs> having not experienced the future. Now, that would be a good thing. That would be a good thing. I remember my second birthday. How do I know that? Because I was two years old and I was on the neighbour's lawn in her front garden with my mum. My mum was talking to the neighbour. I had some toy shears. I'm on the lawn pretending to cut the grass. And the neighbour said to me, how old are you today? And I said, I'm two. I remember that vividly. And I've checked with my mum and that is true. She remembers that as well. I was two years old. I can remember when I was three because I had rheumatic fever. Well, the doctor said I had rheumatic fever. I think with hindsight, I reckon he was lying. Well, let's say he was mistaken. I don't think it was rheumatic fever. I know a lot of people had all that sort of thing in those days, but it's meant to leave you with a weak heart, and that's something I have not got. Do I remember previous to my second birthday? Uh, there are snippets that I do wonder about. I remember hiding behind the runner beans when we lived in the bungalow at Sompting just sort of north of Lansing. We had a small bungalow, a tiny, tiny bungalow, and in the back garden, a row of runner beans, and I remember hiding behind the runner beans, and I had a bucket. I won't tell you what I was doing, <laughs> because you might be eating. I remember that, and my mother remembers that, and she reckons I was about 18 months old. So that that isn't confirmed in my memory. I'm not sure possibly I was told about that, and I'm now thinking it's a memory. No one has come up... I've had several emails, but no one has come up with a memory from being in the womb. Now that, as I said on uh, the midweek message on Wednesday, that would be fascinating, wouldn't it? My nephew, when he was little, he's big now, I remember him saying to his parents, we were there as well, he said, where was I before I was born? There's a question now, here's the thing. No one could answer that. You know, his mum said, well, you weren't born. You sort of didn't exist. And Yeah, but where was I? No one could really answer that. That's a good question, isn't it? Where was I before I was born? And we won't go into that. Interesting though it might be, it's all just going to be, I don't know, dreaming up things and different beliefs in where we've come from and stuff. Alan, this is interesting. I think this is the furthest back any of you have gone with your emails. Alan says... He was walking when he was 10 months old. OK, that's not so uncommon. I've known babies to walk at nine months old. He says, now, here's... Well, no, he doesn't say, here's the thing. I'm saying, here's the thing. Alan says he was in his high chair in the corner of a kitchen, a big kitchen it was, and he says the frying pan, his mum was cooking a meal, evening meal, frying pan caught fire. He remembers it vividly, 10 months old, and his mother has confirmed this. The frying pan caught fire. She grabbed Alan and the high chair. She didn't muck around trying to unstrap him. She grabbed the high chair with him in it, ran out of the back door and put him in the garden, then went back into the house and dealt with the fire. He doesn't say how she dealt with the fire. He remembers sitting in the garden because it was raining. <laughs> it was raining. He managed to get out of the high chair and he walked back to the kitchen and he saw his mother in there there's smoke everywhere and he's got this memory of all this going on and he was 10 months old 
Now, no one's come up with anything earlier than that, 10 months old. Now, as Alan says, anything like, I don't know, someone coming round and having a cup of tea, any sort of mundane events, perhaps wouldn't stay in your mind. But something traumatic and as vivid as a, a fire in the kitchen, the frying pans going up, there's flames and smoke everywhere. You rushed into the garden, dumped out there in the pouring rain. You get out of the high chair, you walk across the grass, lashing with rain, back to the kitchen door, which is open. He remembers it vividly, and his mother has confirmed that he was ten months old. She remembers the year and the month that that happened. Ten months old. Well, thanks for that, Alan. I think you're the winner. You're the winner, unless we get any more emails in the weeks to come. Can anyone remember when they were younger than 10 months old. <laughs> I don't think I get what well, I can't. Apparently, when I was about about that age, about a year old, I grabbed a red-hot poker in the kitchen, which was by the old boiler they used to have. And this poker, my mum had stoked the fire. I'd gone out there, grabbed the red glowing end of the poker, and, of course, I screamed, burnt my hand. No scars, but I don't remember that. Now, that's something I would have thought that would stay in my mind. But no, I don't remember that. I said that the 10-month-old, Alan, was it? 10-month-old, that's the earliest. There's something else that's even earlier, but I haven't counted it because, let me tell you the story. It's Alison's story. Alison remembers, she's got this memory of floating in water, being very warm, not being able to see anything, it's dark, but she can hear what she describes as... A heartbeat, you know, when you're in the womb, kind of, I can't do it, you know how it goes. You probably heard it on the telly, heartbeat in the womb and stuff like that. I think it's the mother's heartbeat, isn't it? She doesn't know whether that's a dream. She's never known. It could be a dream. It could be anything, a false memory. She's not saying that she remembers being in her mother's womb. Now, here really is the thing. Here is the thing. She said to her mother, that since ever she can remember, she's had a piece of music, a tune in her head, that she doesn't know what it is, doesn't know who it's by, but she just remembers this, this music in her head. Her and her mother tried to work out what it was, and then suddenly her mother said, hang on, pulled out some old records, played a record and said, is that it? And it was. Alison said, yes, that is the music. How do I know it? Where's it come from? Apparently... Her mother used to play that piece of classical music to relax when she was pregnant with Alison. She played it almost every day and the idea was it relaxed her so she could just keep herself calm and look after the baby, basically. And she had the music quite loud and Alison reckons that that's what she heard. She heard this music. Now, as she says, make what you will of that. She's not saying it's a fact. She's not saying it's real. She's saying it might be a memory. It could be anything. But that is interesting, isn't it? The trouble is with these early memories and the trouble is with something like Alison's story is that there's no way of proving anything. There's no way of working out if it's real or if it's false or false memory. And this is a thing about when people say, where will I go when I die? Older people say that. I wonder where I'll go when I die. Will I go to heaven or wherever? Where will I go? Well, there's no finding out. We will never know, will we? Because you've got to die and then come back. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to do that. Would you want to come back? Because then we're on the other thing. You come back, you're reborn and all this stuff. You might come back as a, an ant or a dog. I don't know. No one can prove any of it. That's the trouble. But it's all interesting stuff. And then we go back to this, what was it? Generic. Was it genetic? Genetic memory, wasn't it? where memories are passed on. You remember something which was actually your, perhaps your father's or your grandfather's memory. But again, you can't prove any of this one way or the other. So anyway, Alison, thank you for that. That's really interesting. Now you can see why I didn't say Alison's is the earliest memory because we really don't know whether it is or not. It could be, could be a dream or whatever. There are lots of things I remember, especially when I was around three years old. Because again, I've checked with my mum between two and three years old, I had this rheumatic fever thing and I was in bed looking up at the 
the ceiling, uh, you know, the lampshade, one of those big old glass lampshades that they used to hang them on three chains. Do you remember that? Then the light bulbs in the middle. Really old-fashioned stuff. Well, this is early 50s after all. And my dad brought in one of my teddy bears and put it in the lampshade. I don't know why he did that. I think he was trying to make me feel better, make me laugh or something. And when he finally took it out, there was a big scorch mark. It had been against the bulb. It was scorched and burnt. And uh, I do remember that made me cry because that was my favourite teddy bear and he burnt it. <laughs> now, I do know that's true. I've lost the teddy bear now because even in my teens, I had that bear somewhere in a drawer or wherever in the bedroom and it had the burn mark on it. I remember when I was about the same age, three or four, because we left there when I was five. We left the little bungalow in Sompty when I was five. I remember having a, a ride with the milkman in his cart pulled by a horse. He took me up the road in his milk float thing, cart, whatever it was called back then. I don't know how I got back to where I lived. Perhaps he took me back. I don't think he'd have just dumped me at the other end of the road. Not at that age. Anyway, I have loads of memories like that and one or two more emails, which I will tell you about later. But in the meantime, we'll move on. And now for something completely different, as they say. Two or three emails. I won't go into each one, but uh, basically the same question. Early school days, what were they like? That's primary school when I was kind of, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What were they like? It was horrible. It really was horrible. <laughs> I just didn't like it. I, I don't know what it was. I think it must have been me, not the school. I think what it was, I didn't see the point of going there every morning and then standing in the hall and we all had to sing and whatever we did in assembly, then go to a classroom open a book, look at page so-and-so, draw a picture, do this, do that. I just felt it was all pointless. In fact, even in my teens, I was still of the idea that the, the whole thing was pointless. What was I doing at school? I had better things to do. But the early days, uh, one of the emails, did you have any friends? No, I didn't make friends. I didn't like them. They didn't like me. No, that's not strictly true. There were one or two friends I had, but I did find in the main that I, I didn't get on with the other kids. I don't know why. There was one girl. She was lovely. I forget her name. No, I don't. Yes, I do. I forget her name. Hansel. Her surname was Hansel. I can't remember. Isn't it awful? I can't remember her first name. She invited me to her birthday party. Now, I think that's when she was 10. That rings a bell. And that was lovely. Her mum was lovely and there were other kids there. and We had jelly and ice cream and all that. That was really nice. Now, my birthday parties, I didn't invite anyone because <laughs> I was miserable. No, I wasn't miserable. I just didn't want kids round my house. You know, I thought, well, what are we going to do? You know, we're all going to sit there and eat jelly and ice cream. Then what do we do? They'll want to play games and stuff. I had better things to do than <laughs> muck about playing games with, with other children. There was one boy at school I got on with quite well. I sort of assumed that we were best mates. He liked listening on shortwave radio. And we'd spend many an hour in my room on my shortwave radio, tuning around, making notes of the stations we'd heard. He was really into it, aerials and stuff, you know, like I was. Until one day at school, one morning, I called across, hi, how are you doing? And he ignored me, which I thought odd. And he took up with this other boy. I don't know what was going on. And uh, they were sort of turning against me. This sort of friend of mine, Phil, he said, uh, oh, what do you think of Ray's bike, this track bike I'd built? And this other boy said, well, I'm not keen. And Phil, my so-called best mate, said, no, me neither. And they walked off. And I don't know, that seemed to be the end of the friendship. Then one day he started talking to me again. I don't know. And I think being at school, it, it with all of us, it shapes you, doesn't it? It moulds you at an early age into whatever you become. So this is what I've become, <laughs> whatever I am. Seriously, there was a boy at school. He came in one morning to the classroom. We were waiting for the teacher to turn up. He put his feet up on his desk, something he'd never done. And I looked at him, wondered what he was doing. Then I realised he had a brand new pair of boots, Cuban heel boots. They were lovely. His parents had some money. Why were they up on the desk? Why did he put his feet up on the desk? To show off, to show everyone. Look at my boots. Of course, other kids did. Oh, look at those boots. Oh, they're good. Where'd you get those from? I didn't. I, I just went off him completely. 
showing off like that. Later in the day, he said, Ray, what do you think of my boots? I said, they're just the same as mine. And he looked down at my feet and said, well, you've got shoes on. I said, no, no, I don't wear my Cuban Hill boots to school. They're my best ones. They're for going out, not for wearing to this dump. Of course, that shut him up. You know, that was the end of that. But I think that's where I got this, not <laughs> dislike of people. I don't dislike all people, just most of them. <laughs> I don't know what it is. At school, though, I think that's where I I was moulded into what I am now. I'd see kids showing off and other kids were bullies. And I think, why? Why are you bullying that poor little chap? He's all right. What's he done wrong? Just because you're bigger than him. And it just put me off people, basically, as it did school dinners. School dinners put me off everything. Everything food-wise, except for jam sandwiches and beans on toast. With brown sauce, of course. There was one chap I started going downtown with. This is when we're 13. I left at 14. As you know, I ruptured my liver. I've told you that before. We're 13, coming up 14, downtown. And he's stealing from shops. And he was saying, oh, come on, let's go and nick some sweets. Let's nick some fags from this shop. I know a shop where the fags are on display. You can nick them. And I just thought, I'm not going around with him again. I didn't like him. And again, it put me off people, I suppose. But of course, they're not all thieves. They're not all show-offs. They're not all bullies. Just most of them are. <laughs> Seriously, though, I think that's where I got this this from. Uh, I must say, the general public, as they are called, well, we are called because I'm general public as well, aren't I? Uh, the majority of them, I don't. I think they're idiots. I don't like them. They're idiots. <laughs> they're not my listeners. Not you lot. You're lovely. You send me lovely emails and things, and you listen to me. And I like talking to you. I really do look forward to sitting here at my desk in my high-tech studio, having a chat with you. It's like I'm in the pub. I tell you what, hang on, what's the time? It's 20 to 5, Friday afternoon. It's dark. Trisha has got a load of women coming round this evening. I'm going to hide up here. I shall go down, say hello, be polite, do the pleasantries, and then hide up here. (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm not going to hide, you know what I mean. Keep out of the way. They don't meet me down there when they're all doing girl talk. What I was about to say was, it's like being in the pub with you, having a chat over a beer. Now, what have I got in my hand? I've got a pint of real ale. <laughs> well, half a pint, actually. Half a pint, because I've, I drank half of it. It's Friday. We're not going up to our club. We're going there on the 22nd of December, I think, which is... The music quiz, we're going there, sister-in-law and all that stuff. I just thought, as Trish is having all these women round this evening, I'll have a couple of beers up here in my room. They're lovely women. They're her ex-work colleagues, stuff like that. You know, they're really nice. Two have cancelled already, unfortunately, so there's seven coming round. But you're always going to get one or two that can't make it. They're genuine you know, reasons. No such thing as an excuse. There's a reason, not an excuse. So I thought, well, Trish has done a load of cooking loads of cookies you should see down there i'm certainly not going to starve this weekend so i thought i'd have a beer or two while i'm having a chat with you just like we're in the pub in the old days when pubs were pubs and not plastic restaurants selling plastic chips and buns with plastic burgers in did i tell you went to haywards heath yes I, i did i said i was going i went to haywards heath with trish wednesday granddaughter or one of the many granddaughters 18th birthday bless her cotton socks and we had a pub lunch which was very nice in cookfield do you know cookfield look on the map c-u-c-k field cookfield or cuckfield as some people call it incorrectly that was lovely then in the evening we went to our grandson's school and watched the school play that was very very good we stayed overnight in uh, Haywards Heath, in daughter number two's house. Came back Thursday morning, and then we've been out, where are we now? Friday, we've been out for breakfast this morning, daughter number one's birthday, and so it goes on. Tomorrow, Trish and her mum and sister and whoever, they're going to see this Elvis Presley lookalike chap, whatever he's called. I don't do that, I stay here. (laughs) Because I don't like people. And then Sunday... Uh, number one daughter's birthday bash at her house. We've had the breakfast, but not not a bash, you know. The family go round for some drinks and nibbles and whatever. Then Monday, I can't keep up with. I forget Monday. Trish said something about Monday. I don't know what we're doing Monday. We've got these online diaries. In the old days, 
I don't remember all this going on. I don't remember my parents or, you know, when I was young, older people doing all this, going out all the time, round each other's houses every five minutes. And when I was in my teens, twenties, in fact, in my twenties, got married. I don't think we always had people around the house or going to other people's houses. Went to our parents, you know, both sets of parents, of course, on the odd occasion, perhaps on a Sunday. But these days, it seems that, uh, oh, see you at yours at seven. Yeah, OK, see you at yours Saturday morning. It's all this see you at yours, isn't it? I'd rather not see anyone at anyone's. <laughs> no, seriously, I don't like this um, Elvis Presley thing. Elvis Presley's good. I like some of them. It's now or never, stuff like that, really good. But I don't want to go and sit in a village hall in the cold where I don't think they sell beer, or if they do, it's in plastic cups or whatever they are. Uh, I'd rather sit here and talk to you, which is what I will be doing tomorrow afternoon. I will finish this podcast off. I was going to have a chat with you this evening, but then I thought, well, hang on, if I've got a load of drunken, shrieking women downstairs, it could be a little bit orcs <laughs> with a background noise. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm going to sit here for the next half hour chatting to you, drinking beer after beer and end up snoring. <laughs> and all you hear is snoring and slurring or something. No, that's not going to be the case. I only ever have a couple of beers at the weekend, perhaps a Friday, perhaps Saturday have one. These real ales, they're very nice. But if I have more than two, I just, I don't know what it does to me. They don't agree with me. I have a headache all night, a headache in the morning, you know, after a couple of beers. It's weird, isn't it? Now, just going back to what I was saying, which I forget. What was I saying? Actually, it's quite worrying. I have been forgetting things lately. Trish reckons it's because we've got so much going on. I'll say to her, what, what's happening Saturday? Oh, yeah, that. What time's that? Oh, OK. And Sunday? Oh, no, that's Monday. I think it's because there's so much going on. She's right. I'm not going do lally, I don't think. It is difficult to keep up with it all. There's so much going on. I've just been shrieked at. Some of the guests have turned up. So I went down and did my bit, said hello, do you want a drink? Yes, wine, please. So I said to Trish, two wines over there. And I've left her to it. <laughs> Got the coal fire going, which is nice. People like the coal fire. So they're all happy down there. More guests arriving soon. So let's move on. What am I talking about now? Eric, let's talk about your email. Hello, Eric, if you're listening. Thanks for your email. Eric says that many years ago he walked into a pub. Good man, Eric. Where else would you walk into? He walked into a pub that he'd never been into before and he had this deja vu feeling. He'd been there before, but he hadn't. It wasn't even his hometown. He was on holiday for a few days. He says having a break with his wife, walked into this pub hoping to have a bite to eat and a couple of beers. And he knew the pub. He knew it from somewhere. Deja vu, couldn't put it down, do anything. Thought no more of it, just that it was most peculiar. Mentioned this to his mother when they got home. And she said, oh, I know the pub. Your granddad used to go there. When we lived in so-and-so, wherever it was, your granddad frequented that pub as his dad did. So was that this genetic memory business? Now, according to Eric's mum... He had, Eric had never been there. They, well, they had, I mean, he was a kid when they were there. He was a child. So he hadn't been to the pub. They didn't take him into the pub as a child. And yet he remembered a lot of the details about the pub. Some of it had changed over the years, of course. But he remembered a lot of the details, where the toilets were. He says he won't go into all in his email, but there was a picture on the wall in a certain place by this fireplace. And he remembered that. That had always been there. He had a chat with the landlord who had been there quite a while, but not going back to Eric's, obviously, granddad's and great-granddad's time. But he showed him some photos of the pub back in the old days, and Eric said it's exactly what he remembered. But he'd never been there, and no one had ever told him about the pub. No one had described it. Well, they couldn't in that sort of detail. So is that this genetic stuff? That's interesting, Eric. I really don't know. That is interesting, isn't it? Talking of pubs in the old days, I don't think it happens now, but do you remember seeing children sitting on the pavement outside the pub early evening, or even later in the evening, sitting on the pavement? Their mum and dad are in the pub boozing, and there's kids outside on the pavement waiting for their parents. 
and they'd be taking out a packet of crisps or a glass of orange or something. That's back in the 50s. People didn't believe in babysitters. I would take the kids to the pub and they can sit on the pavement outside in the dark. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. That certainly wouldn't be a good idea these days. I think if the police went by in their car and they saw a couple of kids on the pavement outside a pub just sitting there, they'd probably get out of the car and say, you know, what are you two doing? Where's your mum and dad? Oh, they're in the pub. Right, OK, they go in the pub and drag them out, I would think. I don't know. That's just one of the many, many things that are so different now. That wasn't an uncommon sight at all in my day, in the 50s, even in the 60s. I remember going to the pub, you see two or three kids sitting on the path outside, eating crisps, can of Coke or whatever it was they had, and their mum and dad are inside the pub getting plastered. Dreadful, really, isn't it? My parents weren't pub goers, it wasn't their thing. I don't know what they did. They went to what they called the, the company do. In those days, they, in the 50s, they had do's. Not sort of parties or celebrations or whatever. They went to whatever it was, like the, the company do. The company had paid for it all, put on the, the dinner. This is a Christmas thing. Uh, Christmas dinner and drinks and all that stuff. And they all smoked. My dad smoked and Everyone smoking in the place and drinking, and it's just awful. <laughs> uh, not that I was there, I was at home. Did we have babysitters? I think we must have had someone come round and sit with us while they were on these Christmas do's. But they weren't going out type people, they weren't pub people or anything like that. Perhaps that's where I got it from. Having said that, I said to my sister-in-law this morning, we were talking about people being ill, and I said, well, I, I'm pretty healthy, a bit overweight, but healthy. She said, you've got good genes, you have, you've got good genes. And I said, well, I've spent most of my life smoking and drinking in pubs, <laughs> which is true. Well, not most of my life, but uh, quite a few years. And she said, yeah, but it's in your genes, you've got good genes. I was a bit silly. I said, yeah, well, Trish has washed and ironed them. But uh, anyway, she just raised her eyes to the ceiling and sighed. And then we carried on chatting. I don't know. She's lovely. That's the nurse. And I was awake the other night. I was awake for hours planning the interview with my sister-in-law, the nurse interview. What was it like in your day? What happened on the Monday morning when you first went to work as a nurse? Where did you go? Were you thrown in at the deep end? Were you in a classroom? Were you in a ward where there's actual real people with real health problems? I was planning all these questions to ask her. I must do it. I've been saying all year, haven't I? I'm going to interview my sister-in-law. And she has said yes. She's agreed to do it, but i I just got to get round to it. You see, if my social calendar wasn't so full, I'd have time. Well, I say my social calendar, Trisha's social calendar. Mine's empty. That's the way I like it. One of the younger members of our family the other day said... Did people pinch bicycles back in your day? And I said, well, yes, there were bicycles pinched. And he said, did you lock them up? Yeah, we had kind of a chain and a padlock. And I said, yeah, what's all this about? He had seen on wherever, online somewhere, people going round with a battery-powered angle grinder, grinding off the, the big, you know, the U-bolt type U-padlock things, U-shaped things, and stealing decent bikes. And he said, how, how did they steal them in your day if they didn't have battery power uh, angle grinders? I said, well, they had sort of bolt croppers and hacksaw or whatever. And a lot of them weren't locked up. They'd just walk off with them. And we were just chatting in general about crime and all the tools he was saying they've got these days. If, for example, the battery powered angle grinder. And also, he was talking about the ULES cameras. And he said, what did you lot do if there was a speed camera? Did you vandalise it or cut the pole down or something? And I said, well, no, no, we didn't have speed cameras. Oh, so you could do what speed you like. I said, well, yes, I got caught speeding once. This must have been in, oh dear, when was that? The 70s, early 70s. I come off the main road. I thought the road I turned into was 40 miles an hour. It wasn't, it was 30. And there was this copper put his hand up. Evening, oh, you're nicked. <laughs> I went past the chap with the radar gun and he radioed his mate and said, stop the chap in the whatever car it was, which he did. My friend was in the car and this cop said, 
Anything we'll say will be taken down and whatever. And my friend shouted out, trousers. Oh, I mean, that's a pathetic joke. And this copper said, is he a mate of yours? I said, no, just someone I'll give you a lift. He said, just as well, you don't want mates like that. <laughs> I got, was it three points on my licence? I said to him, I thought it was 40 here. He said, it's built up area. Don't you know your highway code? And then he said, no. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I must look at the highway code. I must look at today's modern version of the highway code because so much has changed. We're coming back from Haywards Heath and I'm saying to Trish, what do these lines mean here? She said, oh, it means whatever. I said, well, what's that sign? What's that there? I haven't seen that before. There's all these new road signs and lines all over the place. She said, you're going to have to get the highway code. I've got a sneaky feeling that's going to be one of my Christmas presents. Oh, lovely. What did you get for Christmas? Oh, a copy of the highway code. <laughs> well, it's better than three points on your licence. So far, I've had one beer, a sausage roll, a mince pie, and a cheese and something muffin. This isn't going to end well, is it? I can feel the calories adding up already. <laughs> oh, it's Christmas. Who cares? It's Christmas, isn't it? My son, here we go, North Carolina. We were talking about beer, and he said, what do you want beer for? I said, well... Nice to have a beer or two at the weekend. Why? You don't need beer. This is his thing. I know he's listening. He listens to all these. I know you're listening. You don't need beer, he says. You don't need cake, <laughs> mince pies, sausage rolls, cheese and something, muffins. You don't need all this stuff. What is it? Empty calories. Something like empty calories. He told me how to lose weight. And I said, that's good. Thank you. And he said, I know you won't do it. You won't listen to me. You won't do it. What was it? No bread, no potatoes, no beer, no cheese and something, muffins. Stone the crows, but that record by the vapours, what is it? Uh, I can't remember the words. I always forget the words. No sex, no drugs, no beer, whatever, no you. No wonder it's dark. <laughs> anyway, I've only had one beer, so I am behaving myself. They're all down there shrieking and drinking. Turning Japanese by the vapours, that's what it was. Let's go back to the old days. Red phone boxes. Who misses red phone boxes? I do. The old letter boxes. What's happened to the postal system, the post office? Is it still the general post office? The GPO in the UK? What has happened? I rarely see a postman. I know I've banged on about this before. Four deliveries a day. Morning post, late morning post, afternoon post, evening post, nine o'clock at night. Four deliveries a day of letters. Now... You're lucky to get four deliveries a month. Seriously, we don't see the postman day in, day out. I'm always saying to Trish, we haven't had post for a week. She says, no, that's right. Suddenly, a load of post turns up. Trains are on strike. Do we have train strikes back in the 50s and 60s? I suppose we must have done. But I don't think they were, I don't know, they were different somehow. I suppose they were steam engines. Well, now going back to when I was a boy in 1860-something, of course we had strikes. It's just that these days, they're well, they've been on and off strike, haven't they, for the last year. This dispute has been going on for a year. Talking to my son-in-law the other day, up in Haywards Heath, lovely part of the country, and he said that it's not about money, because I was saying, the train drivers, aren't they on 65000 a year? You know, it's not bad money. Is it for a four-day week? And he said, no, 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 it's not all about money. He's very clever, my son-in-law, very intelligent chap. It's about conditions, job security. We were talking, this is interesting, we were talking about people losing their jobs because of automation. Now, Trisha said, because uh, she was in on the chat, she said, my dad, when he was a, a driver of a steam engine, he had a fireman. When they all went over to electric or diesel trains, the fireman was redundant. So technology is forging ahead and we no longer need someone to chuck coal on the fire. They did get other jobs on British Rail, of course. And I pointed out that when the, the post office, with their letters, there used to be loads of men and women, better say that as I get sued, sorting through the letters. That one's for Doncaster, that one's for Liverpool, that one's for London, that one's for Cornwall, whatever. And along came automation and computerised stuff and loads of people were redundant. And of course, everyone said, right, that's it, all out, on strike, we're not having this. On strike. So the main subject of our discussion was, what do you do when 
progress comes along and everything is automated, what do you do with the people? You can't say, OK, we're not going to have all the letters automatically sorted by computers. You can all keep your jobs and we'll do it the Victorian way. And the firemen on the steam engines, you can sit next to the driver on the electric trains and just kind of be there doing nothing. We'll call you a fireman. You've still got your job, but you just sit there doing nothing. This is the trouble, isn't it, with automation. What do you do? Now we've got this AI stuff coming along and they reckon that we'll all be out of a job. <laughs> they don't need authors, don't need playwrights because they'd all do it for you and things. I don't know. It's a difficult one, isn't it? You either go with automation or you don't. I remember in the 50s, companies trying to modernise their plant, get rid of the old Victorian stuff and bring in new technology. And they couldn't. People went on strike. We're not having that. Oh, no, because no, so many people will lose their jobs. It is difficult, isn't it? Of course, so many people will lose their jobs. But what could you do? Do you just say, well, we'll, we'll stay with the Victorian machinery? Our discussion was quite interesting, but we didn't really come to a conclusion. Well, I suppose we did. The conclusion was you technology wins and people are redundant, which is a shame. Email from Neil. Hello, Neil. He says that many years ago, he's retired now, back in the old days, in the good old days, he was a plumber, self-employed. Do you remember this podcast episode I did all about people working from home, self-employed, and it was difficult because friends and neighbours would say, oh, day off at home again, day off. And you're working, you know, you're working from home. Neil says he was a plumber, so he, he basically worked from home, but he didn't. He was out doing plumbing jobs, of course. But his office was at home. This is an old one, Neil. You must have looked back at some old episode. When was that? Back in the summer, I think we talked about that. He said the same thing. He popped back for lunch or some spares. He had a garage full of plumbing bits. He'd pop back and perhaps a neighbour or someone would walk past or see him. Oh, another day off then. You skiving again. And he said, no, I'm having some lunch. Am I allowed to have lunch? Or you know, is that against your rules? Or I've come back for some parts. I need this, I need that for a plumbing job. And he said he got fed up with it. <laughs> Absolutely fed up with it. I just thought I'd throw that one in, Neil, because uh, we were talking about that and a lot of you did respond. Of course, these days, someone working at home, the chances are they're working for a company, but they're just working from home. So they're not self-employed. So they're not skiving off. I don't know. Anyway, thanks for that, Neil. That... Uh, that was good. I did have quite a few other emails about that that I haven't mentioned because it would take up too much time. But good response. I do like emails. Raise rants at protonmail.com. I was a little bit late replying to some this week because of my, as I said, my social calendar. I'm just so busy, busy with all these functions and things. <laughs> but I do try to reply. Well, I do reply to them all. I try to do it as, as fast as I can. Not seeing my mother tomorrow. She's going to a wedding. A lot of my side of the family are going to this wedding. And I, I think it's going to be raining, which is a great shame. I'm not going myself. Well, Trish and I aren't going. But I think the weather forecast is dreadful. It's not really a good time of year, is it, to have a wedding? December? We were married in September, and that was a little bit late in the year. We had a lovely day. That's a long time ago. Struth. But anyway, my mum's going to this wedding, so we're not going to see her tomorrow. We won't be popping round for coffee and a chat and doing a bit of housework. We shall see her next Saturday instead. This build-up to Christmas is funny, isn't it? It's strange. All the preparations, all the food that Trish has done. We've done all the decorations. We put the tree up and the lights and all this stuff we've done. All basically for one day, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, of course. That's when the family are all here. And then take the whole lot down, put it all back up into the loft, take the lights down, put the tree in the loft. We don't have a real tree. And it's all over. <laughs> There's this huge build-up. They start in August, don't they? Christmas stuff in the shops, on the radio, so many shopping days to Christmas. And it's just one day, basically. And for some people, it's not even that. They have to work. But, as I say, every single year, once Christmas is over... We can look forward to the spring. That's what I like. I'm going to do the record the beginning of this podcast episode tomorrow, Saturday, and stick it on the front. 
So when you when you hear me saying it's Saturday, half past six in the morning, blah blah blah, the wind's doing this and the flag's doing that, then later on you'll hear me saying it's Friday. <laughs> so it's it's not me getting confused; it's me trying to confuse you. I do that though. I leave the intro very often till almost the last minute, even Sunday morning when this episode comes out. I'll get up early. Well, I get up early anyway. Four o'clock this morning. I couldn't believe it. Four o'clock. I was awake, wide awake. So I got up. Trisha was asleep. I got up, had a cup of tea, looked at my iPad, came in here, put my radios on. No one chatting on the radios, of course. Four in the morning. Anyone with any sense is still asleep. I don't know what it is. It's as I get older, I'm waking up earlier. I won't be going to bed at all at this rate if we carry on like this. Four o'clock. I did eventually get back in the bed. I think I must have dozed off a bit, but then I was awake at, what was it, half five, and I thought, that's it. That's it, up and dressed. It's strange, isn't it? Getting old, it is strange. A lot of youngsters say to me, what's it like getting old? I just say, I don't know, I'm not there yet. (laughs) I am, I'm getting there slowly. I love it. I do love these years. My dad said to me once, this is weird. He was in his 40s. I was 20-something. And he said, what, what do you reckon have been the, the best years of your life? And I said, well, I don't know yet. I'm only 20, whatever I was, 20-something. I said, I'll tell you when I'm sort of 80. And he said, well, I won't be there then. And of course, he won't be here when I'm 80. He's not here now. But what a strange thing to say. What are the best years? He said his best years were his 40s. And I said, yeah, but you're in your 40s now. You don't know that. Let's move on. What should we talk about now? Look at that. Three quarters of an hour. I've still only had one beer. You probably think I've had six. I discovered today on the radio that, you know, these vaping things, all the kids are vaping now. You can get these vape things without nicotine. They're just this nice, well, I I don't say nice, apparently this lovely flavour of fruit or whatever. I think it's awful. And you can just puff away on this thing, this smoke and steam and flames all pour out of it. And there's no nicotine, so there's nothing to get addicted to. And I think that's the way that people are hoping it's going to go, because so many kids are turning to these vape things. When I was a boy, we had proper cigarettes. We had woodbine, none of this modern rubbish. Woodbine and a a petrol lighter. And if you didn't have a petrol lighter, a box of Swan Vesta matches. We did it properly in our day. Talking of my son as I was earlier, I've got to contact him. He, he's into computers. I've got this thing. I'm trying to program my radios. See, in the old days, you turn the radio on, you let the valves warm up, and then you listen to it, and it works. Now, I'm talking about my amateur radio gear, you know, the transceiver things and all that. You have to program them with the computer. So I plug the radio into the computer, and it says... Can't read from radio. I mean, what do you mean you can't read from the radio? Can't write to the radio. And you have to change the COM port. So I go, well, what's that? Oh, COM port 4. Can't read from radio. OK. Oh, look, COM port 9's open. Uh, oh, that works. Next time I do it, no, COM port 9 isn't there. COM port 11. I've got to ask him what all these COM ports are and why they keep changing. What's going on? In my day amateur radio gear you've got all the knobs on the front of the radio you don't program things and you don't have memories you relied on your own memory where was i chatting to that chap last week oh yes 6.67 mega cycles as it was in the old days now it's megahertz (laughs) anyway i've got to ask him i want to download a program to program one of my radios a bit of software and he said you must run it through this thing to check for virus and stuff and it comes up alert warning warning not not will smith was it anyway warning warning alert trojan horse alert and stuff so i've got to ask him about that as well i'm very lucky to have someone you know my son that knows all about this stuff because i don't know what i'm doing well you've gathered that already (laughs) haven't you i don't know why the computer doesn't say instead of just i can't read from the radio Why doesn't it say, I can't read from the radio because, blah, 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 and to fix it, you will have to do this, blah, blah, blah. Instead of just saying, I can't read from the radio and sulking. What's the point in sulking? I mean, what's the point in the computer that can't 
tell you what's wrong with itself. All this stuff about AI and robots and computers are going to take over the world. Human beings will be redundant. Well, how can that be true when the computer can't even tell you what's wrong with it? You go to run a program or, or whatever. Can't do that. That's all the notice says. Can't do that. Illegal operation or whatever it's illegal. Can't do that. Against the rules. One of my one of my radios, I went to program it and I put in the make and model number and it said, your radio is in the not allowed list. Not allowed list? What does that mean? I can't program that radio because it's on the naughty step. <laughs> I don't know. It's strange, isn't it? I'm about to put the podcast uh, on. It's just about finished. I only had one can last night. <laughs> I had several in the fridge but only have one can. A few sausage rolls and bits and pieces. Up early this morning, which is good. Now, Luke. Now, hang on, where's your email, Luke? Well, you don't know, do you? Because you're not here. <laughs> he says he lives in London. And he says these LTNs, nothing to do with uh, memories from when you're young, he's saying here. Apologies for that. Low traffic network. No, neighbourhoods, isn't it? No, Low traffic neighbourhoods. He says, what with those and... Some cycle lanes, which are, as he puts it, really inappropriate. You just don't need them where they are. He says it's really restricting traffic flow. And also built out pavements and uh, other restrictions everywhere. He took a bus journey. 11 minutes, 10 to 11 minutes, his usual bus journey. He took a bus journey uh, recently. He's gone back to working. I won't go into all that. He's been working from home. Back on his bus journey to work. Not 11 minutes anymore because of all this stuff. 45 minute journey. It's un unbelievable, isn't it? From 11 minute journey, 45 minutes. And he's saying the pollution from the bus is going to be far more than it, it would be if it was a quick 11 minute journey. I, I don't know. And as for the sticky out pavement bits, the built out pavements, as I've said before, we've got them here in Worthing and they are dangerous cars have hit them there's no light or anything on them you've just got this pavement each side of a junction that sticks out into the road and everyone i've spoken to about it other drivers you know, they're all saying the same thing they're dangerous and what they've had to do in some places is stick temporary bollards and a sign you know keep to the right if you're in america keep to the left you know what i mean because we drive on the left because they're dangerous people are hitting them they're smashing into the sticking out bit of pavement, wrecking their cars on the you know the high curb. It's just crazy. Thanks for that, Luke. You just end by saying, if they want motorists out of London, then just ban the whole thing, ban cars altogether, because this is just causing a major problem. Someone the other day was saying parking in Brighton, what was it, £5.50 an hour. So if you want to spend the day in Brighton, shopping, out for lunch, it's going to cost you a fortune. In Worthing here... It costs, you, you just can't, it's basically they're trying to p get people out of the town centre, out of Brighton city centre. Basically, the councils don't want you there. I don't know what the shopkeepers must think, because so many people now are going online anyway, and what they're doing in town is making it even more difficult to go and do your shopping. So, I don't know, I don't know what's wrong with the councils. Anyway, I won't rant and rave about that. Councils are just totally useless. And there's no point in taking the train or planning to take the train to Brighton to do your shopping because they're on strike every five minutes. And when they're not on strike, there's engineering works and goodness knows whatever else. So that's a waste of time. The bus takes hours to get there because it goes all round the towns, all round little houses on its way to Brighton. It takes hours. And also you can't lug a load of shopping home on the bus, can you? Not if you're doing a major shop. And of course, the major problem with the bus is the traffic. Everywhere is gridlocked, so the bus can't get anywhere on time. I think parking should be free in major cities and towns for one hour. To say the first hour is free, then after that you have to pay. Because if you just want to pop down the shops, you want to get a few bits and pieces, and it will take you less than an hour, that's ideal. And also that way you've got cars coming in and going out again. So the spaces will keep appearing, if you see what I mean. But no, 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 they don't do that. They just put the fees up, parking fees, so it makes it impossible for people to go there. 
that's enough about that. We're coming up to the hour. Oh, by the way, that chap at school, that one with his uh, Cuban heel boots, who was always peddling his show offery. Whenever he came into school in something, he had a new blaze. As I said, his parents had money. And he'd go around doing his show offery bit. He eventually ended up... <laughs> he ended up with no money at all. He started a business. He went bankrupt. His parents apparently moved abroad somewhere. He was left on his own here and went bankrupt. So that's uh, all his Cuban Hill boots and his new clothes and the parents' money didn't get him anywhere at all. I'm not saying serves him right. It's just that I didn't like him. <laughs> One more email just arrived. Hello, Emma. You're just in time. I was about to say goodbye to everyone. This is to do with memories when you're young, but it's slightly different. Emma and her sister are identical twins. She says when they were young, her sister and her were meant to go out with their grandparents for the day, but Emma was ill, so her sister went with the grandparents on her own. When her sister eventually got home, Emma said, Were you OK with that dog? You were frightened, weren't you? And her sister said, How do you know about the dog? Apparently an Alsatian had leapt up at Emma's sister when she was out with her grandparents and frightened her, and there was no way Emma could know that. Now that's strange. This is the days before mobile phones, so there was no message coming through or anything like that. How did Emma know that her sister had been afraid of this Alsatian dog that jumped up? Another incident that she cites here, as she's put it, I cite another incident, it's a good word. She said that uh, Emma herself went to a party without her sister, and the police turned up at the party, and this policeman went in, a neighbour had complained about the noise, and he'd said, uh, you've got to turn that down, and blah, blah, blah. When Emma got home from the party, her sister said, was that policeman all right that turned up? And Emma said, how do you know that? And her sister said, I've no idea how I know that. I've just got it in my mind that this policeman turned up because uh, someone had complained about the noise, which was correct. And again, there was no way that she could know that. Emma says that there have been a lot of incidents over a lot of years she says they're now both married, they've both got children, and she says it can be embarrassing sometimes because we know what's happening in each other's lives. If there's been an argument or some incident, then the other sister knows about it. But as she says, not all the time, but now and then things like that do crop up. There have been various studies, haven't there, over the years about identical twins and telepathy and is it? I always get that mixed up. Telethopy, telepathy. It's telepathy, isn't it? Not telethe. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean. Look at that. An hour almost. Struth, what am I doing? The weather's still awful. Everything's awful outside. It's soaking wet. There's puddles everywhere and everything is horrible. Horrid. There we are. What was it the Queen said? Anis horribilis or something. Right, take care everyone. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Take care, I will see you on Wednesday. And uh, we'll have a little natter about something then. Getting closer to Christmas. Uh, I think I've told you we've done all the lights, the tree, the decorations, all that stuff. And our social calendar is absolutely jam-packed. <laughs> Trisha's out this afternoon. That's the Elvis Presley look-alike thing or whatever it is, tribute. I'm staying here in the warm and dry. OK, take care, and I will see you Wednesday. Oh, yeah, as usual, don't do anything I wouldn't do, or is it do what you like and have fun. Bye-bye for now.